Hello again, and thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. Uh, today we'll be talking about how to move people to action and why grassroots organizing. This is the second time uh, we're doing this webinar and really excited to dive into this material. Um, this webinar really is for anyone who's interested in learning more about grassroots organizing and wanting to actually do the work of putting pen to paper to begin strengthening their own campaign plans. So this is the first of three webinars that we're going to do. We'll have two others in the coming months. So uh, we look forward to your participation uh, in this one and the following. So let's get into this webinar. Uh, first thing to know, we're going to talk a little bit about our partnership. This webinar is brought to you um, as a partnership between the Broadband Institute and 270 Strategies. As many of you already know, the Broadband Institute is a progressive nonprofit organization uh, that's been providing hard-hitting facts about what's going on in the political and the advocacy world in Canada. And then 270 Strategies, we are an engagement consulting firm. Um, we were born out of the Obama campaign, and since our existence, we've been working, working and partnering with companies, causes, and campaigns to build winning grassroots campaigns, um, and we really are strategic and take a data-driven approach to our work. So I want to tell you a little bit about your presenters for today. You have me. My name is Natalie Cohn. I'm an engagement associate with uh, 270 Strategies. And uh, in my time at 270, I've done a lot of work uh, to build grassroots campaigns for our education clients, as well as some of our nonprofit clients. Um, and really excited to talk to you all about grassroots organizing. It's one of my favorite subjects and something that I was introduced to very early on. Um, as a kid, I would go with my dad to Canvas and register voters. And uh, from an early age, seeing him be engaged in the community really taught me the importance of community engagement and the transformative change that can come about when we are engaged, when we do grassroots work. So really, really excited to talk to you more about that today. Also on the call, um, we have my colleague Kristen Purdy. Kristen is an engagement project manager at 270, and I'll allow her to, to introduce herself. Kristen? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you. As Natalie said, I'm a, an engagement project manager here at 270, and I've been with our team for about three years. Um, mostly, I have experience in the nonprofit background, um, so working on issue advocacy across the U.S. on, on domestic issues, as well as electoral work, um, having worked on both of President Obama's campaigns. Um, so we're excited to talk with you all today and hopefully can um, help answer any questions that you have. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kristen. So let's get into the goals of today's conversation. We have two goals for you. Uh, the first goal is for you, the participant, to have an understanding of the foundational philosophy behind community and grassroots organizing, so the how and why we do grassroots organizing. And then uh, we want for you to have a general understanding of how to start planning a campaign that utilizes, excuse me, that utilizes grassroots organizing. Um, and you'll actually get a chance to work on and start defining your own campaign's mission and goals. So those are the few of the things that we're going to do in today's webinar. Um, our agenda, we've already gone through our goals and agenda, but we're going to have a quick icebreaker and then we'll get into the meat of this webinar talking about campaigns and grassroots organizing. We're going to talk about um, grassroots campaign planning. We're going to then workshop your own campaign plans, specifically focusing on your campaign mission and goal. And then we'll end this webinar uh, with a quick discussion. We're going to talk question and answers and then discuss next steps. So that's our agenda for, for today's webinar. So some norms for our conversation. Um, we really want this webinar to be as effective and engaging as possible. We understand that sometimes it can be difficult to be engaging when you're not face-to-face -face and on a webinar, but we've set some norms um, on how we hope to do that. So the first thing is participate. We love your participation. We love to hear from you, and the best way that you can participate and engage with us is by writing your questions and your comments in the chat box. So um, in this visual, on towards the right of your screen, or. It, your box might be in another part of your screen. But if you look to your control panel, um, if you go all the way to the bottom of your control panel, you'll see a menu item that says chat. And uh, below, you'll see type message here. That's where you'll go ahead and just type any questions that you have, any comments that you have. And uh, during the webinar, I'll be presenting, but Kristen 
we'll try her best to answer all of them um, and be in communication with you throughout the webinar. Um, we'll also have designated times for question and answer as well. Um, and then another way that you can participate towards the end of the webinar, mention that you're actually going to get to practice writing out your mission and your goals. And that's going to be through the webinar worksheet. So if you go to the, menu, the materials drop down item, you'll see a worksheet that says organizing to win. It's also at the top of the chat. Um, when we get to that part of the webinar, uh, you can then select that document and, and, we'll, and, and, we'll, work, and, and we'll work on and we'll work on that. Those are our norms for today's conversation. So you know a little bit about us now, Kristen and I. Uh, we want to get to know a little bit more about you, and we can actually practice using the chat box now. So I'd love for you all to introduce yourselves, uh, type your name, organization, and a fun fact about yourselves in the chat box. Um, I can give an example. Uh, my name is Natalie. I work with 270 Strategies, and a fun fact about me, although I'm a millennial, I'm a huge fan of 70s disco music. So I'd love to hear from you all if you can begin chatting in uh, the chat box. Looks like we have um, Kimberly. Kimberly is uh, a, a newfie and owns a Newfoundland dog named Simon. Awesome. Welcome, Kimberly. We have Pamela. Welcome, Pamela and Lila. Betsy. Betsy plays bluegrass. Very cool. We have Tina. Welcome, Tina. We have Riley, who's a student and is a huge Drake fan. Riley, I also like Drake. Very cool. Uh, Danelle, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, is the co-chair of the Political Action Committee. And um, sews uh, their own shiny shoes. Very cool. We have um, Simone. We have Corey. Welcome all. So happy to have you all on the webinar. And because we have so many participants, I'm not going to be able to read everyone's information, but welcome to the webinar, and I hope that you all will continue to look in the chat box, see one another's name, and know that we have some really awesome and interesting people participating, uh, that you're not in this alone, and um, hopefully we'll continue to hear from one another throughout this webinar. So welcome again. So let's get into the webinar and get into the subject. We're talking about why grassroots organizing, right? So today you're going to learn a lot about um, why, why we do campaigns. We're going to talk about theory of change. We're going to talk about power, how we get power, how we influence those who have power. Um, we're going to talk about strategic framework. So these are just a few of the things that we'll talk about using relevant case studies um, and also looking to receive your feedback throughout to, make sh to see your understanding of this work as well. So the foundation of this, uh, of all this work, really is campaigns. And campaigns are a series of organized actions that seek to bring about change around a specific issue. And I'll read that one more time. It says campaigns are a series of organized actions that seek to bring around change, bring about change around a specific issue. And I love this definition. And a few of the things that stick out to me in this definition is that uh, campaigns are a series of organized actions. And the term organized actions really highlights the importance of planning and intention, that it's not random actions. These are very intentional actions. And then towards the bottom of the definition, um, organized actions that seek to bring about change around a specific issue. And the fact that these uh, issues are specific, bringing change around the specific issues, uh, shows that um, we know what we're working towards, right? And that's something that we're going to get into a little bit more in the coming slides. So all of this really connects to theory of change. We're all here and we're all doing the work that we do with the organizations that we're a part of because we want to see some kind of change in the world, right? As we build campaigns, um, we have to define how we're going to bring about that change. And that really is your theory of change. Your theory of change is how change happens, how the actions you take will ultimately bring about change. So now that we've talked about theory of change and you know that a theory of change is your theory of how change happens, how, how do you all think change happens? Would love to hear um, your feedback and your thoughts on this. 
and you can put that in the chat box. Awesome, I see a response. We have sharing stories. Change can happen through sharing stories. We have collective awareness leads people to take action. Um, we have walking the walk, so leading by example. Um, I love this one, being willing to stand up and speak up. Um, Lila says, by a collective group working together. Excellent, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Riley says, mobilization of communities. Pamela says, when things fall apart, change is inevitable. All really awesome responses and, and very true to how change happens. So, uh, we know that there are a lot of different theories about how change happens. We just saw it in, in the comments that you all left. And, you know, when we think about theories of change, you know, some people believe that change just happens over time, right? They think that it is the natural course of things and that with each generation, people just become more and more progressive. And at 270, that's, that's not what we believe. We believe that change happens because you make it happen. It's something that you're very intentional about. And we believe there are three elements to change and to creating a theory of change. And those three elements are purpose, people, and power. So purpose really is having a clear goal. It's having an understanding of the change that you want to see in the world. And then there's people. You want to have people who are committed to making that change happen, like-minded individuals who can join your campaign um, and help you mobilize. And then power. Power is the resources to make that change happen, right? And it's looking at it in two ways. It's understanding, one, who has the power to make the change, and two, it's also thinking about how you will influence the people who have power to make change. So purpose, people, and power. I have an example of a, a campaign that did that very well. Uh, we often think about the civil rights movement as a really successful campaign, uh, the civil rights movement in the 1960s in the US. So during the civil rights movement, they had a very clear purpose, right? Organizers and participants in this movement really wanted uh, to end segregation and discrimination of black people in the United States, and they wanted to fight for equal rights under the law through the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So they had a very clear purpose. And then they had people. They had people involved all over the U.S. Um, from different groups. You had student groups like SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You had religious groups. Um, you had folks all over taking action, such as boycotting, uh, participating in sit-ins, protesting, and doing marches. Uh, so people were very active and very crucial to this movement and to this work. And then there was power. Uh, because of these acts of civil disobedience that people took, um, it helped draw a lot of attention, and they were able to move people in power to, to make changes and eventually get the Civil Rights Act passed. So that was a very clear example of how a campaign used purpose, people, and power to create change. We can also think of other campaigns, other popular campaigns, like Occupy Wall Street, right? Occupy Wall Street uh, got a lot of attention, and they had so many people all over involved. But when you talk to the people who are involved, there wasn't a clear sense of purpose. There wasn't an end goal. There wasn't one thing that they wanted to see accomplished. Because Occupy Wall Street had the people power but didn't have the purpose, they weren't able to move power and create change. So it's crucial that when thinking about how you're creating change, you're, you're being intentional and you're relying on the power of purpose, people, and then moving power. So this really all comes down to organizing. When we can't create change on our own, we find others who are like-minded and work together to create the change that we want to see. That's organizing. And grassroots organizing, really, it's you're finding others who have a shared interest, and you're working together to take action. And it's not just finding people who have a shared interest. It's also finding people who are affected by the issue at hand, right? And then working with them, you're identifying the decision makers and the people in power who can fix the, the problem, fix the issue. And that's really what organizing about is about. It's finding people and then moving power. And this, there's a long history of this, um, long grassroots organizing history 
and um, we can think back to the Indian independence movement. I just talked a bit about the civil rights movement. And then we can also think about an, a more uh, relative context, the Claypot uh, protest in Canada. So these are all examples of grassroots organizing, of uh, movements that found people, like-minded people, people who were affected and who cared about the issue, and organized these people to move power and to create change. So now we want to bring it back to you and making it more practical to your everyday work, right? So we're going to talk about the five key practices of campaigns and organizing. So they're storytelling, and someone mentioned that as one of the ways that we create change, right? It's relationship building, it's strategizing, it's structuring, and it's action. So a storytelling. Storytelling really is one of the most powerful tools a person has to move others to action. Um, I love using stories because I feel like stories really communicate values. Uh, they help communicate emotions, right? They talk about hope and they inspire people to action. And we know that when people are inspired, they're more likely to act. So storytelling is really one of the greatest tools that you can use uh, to influence others and get others um, rally, rallied and excited for your cause. And then there's relationship building. Uh, during the 2012 campaign, we often said, the people will come for the president, right? They'll come for the issues, they'll organize because of that, but they'll stay because of the people and because of the relationships that they built. And we know that the strongest bonds uh, provide the most compelling incentive for engagement, right? Personal commitments are often stronger motivators than solely uh, fighting for the greater good. So relationship building is so crucial to work uh, because people really stay and stay engaged because of the relationships that they built. Number three, um, strategizing. Strategizing is so important to campaigns and organizing. You need to have a strategy, a clear approach to how you're getting your work done um, and how you're meeting your goal. But with strategy, it's important to know that strategy is a process. It's not a static plan on paper. So you have to be willing to adapt um, as your circumstances change. And then uh, structuring. You want to have a very clear uh, and strong structure um, so that you're, the folks that you're organizing and engaging um, can work together. During uh, the Obama campaign, we worked in teams. Uh, we had a neighborhood team model that got really popular. It was also called the Snowflake model. And what made uh, this structure really effective is that uh, people shared responsibility. They worked together to accomplish goals. But then there were also uh, clear roles, clear responsibility, clear team norms. Um, and everyone was coordinated. So that's why it's so important to have a structure. And then action. All of these things that I just mentioned, storytelling, relationship building, strategizing, structuring, they all um, combine together to work towards action, which is the ultimate goal, moving people to action, creating some kind of change. And with action, you always want to make sure that your action is data-driven. And what I mean by that is that you want to uh, you want to measure the actions that you're taking. If you, without measuring, you're not able to track what you're doing and track the effectiveness. So you, you want to see um, what actions you're taking towards meeting your goal and whether or not they're the most effective. Um, and that way you can, can make changes to make sure that they are effective. So it's storytelling, relationship building, strategizing, structuring, and action. Those are the five key practices of campaigns and organizing. And one thing that's also important to know is that grassroots organizing really is about leadership. Um, and that is something that Marshall Gantz always talks about. Dr. Marshall Gantz, he's one of the leading thinkers of organizing, and he helped shape um, Obama's campaign, actually helped shape Obama's organizing work before the campaign. And then that, um, from there, influenced a lot of the work that he did um, in both campaigns. So Marshall Gantz says, leadership is taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose in the face of uncertainty. And I really love this quote. I'll repeat it one more time. It says, leadership is taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose in the face of uncertainty. And I love this quote because it's both aspirational and it's inspirational. What leaders do is leaders really empower others to do more than they even imagine that they can do. And they help them feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. Um, and we know that this organizing work, there is a lot of uncertainty in it, right? 
but uh, leaders are able to um, still empower, engage, and mobilize people through the insurgent journey, and they're able to show a clear outcome and, and something that they're driving towards, um, a bigger picture that, that helps to inspire uh, those that they're organizing. So organizing really is about leadership. So at this point, we've, we've talked about a lot of different things. We talked about campaigns, we talked about theory of change and how change happens. Um, we talked about the long history of grassroots organizing and some best practices. So I want to open the floor um, to questions. I know that some questions may have come in during the time that I was speaking. Um, if you all have questions that are coming up now, feel free to chat them in the chat box and I'll turn it over to Kristen um, to help manage the questions or, or share any highlights. Hi everyone, just feel free to throw a question in the chat box. Great. All right, so seeing a few questions coming on in. Um, so I don't think we're going to get Oh, so many great questions. Uh, let's start off with Lori's questions. We'll be going into more detail on the five key practices, um, in particular structuring. So I don't think we're going to get too much into kind of our, with the way that we talk about models today, um, but that's something that we can uh, definitely talk about. Um, and Natalie, feel free to speak to that too, kind of knowing what else is coming up. But we are going to talk a little bit about campaign planning as well, so that'll be part of the conversation there, but more from a strategic standpoint. Um, and I don't know if that is part of a future um, broadband training, but that could be. So Natalie or Alejandra, feel free to speak there. Um, and Lila, you talk. Absolutely right. Go ahead, Natalie. I think that's, that's right, Kristen. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about uh, structuring and strategy in the upcoming slides. Um, and some of the other things will be in future trainings. Great. Um, Lila, you bring up a question about uh, in groups, how do we make sure that grassroots means the same thing for everyone? Uh, and I think that that is a, a great question, right? We all come kind of with our own understanding of, of definitions. Um, and uh, I think when we get together and we, we set goals for what we want to do and we're talking about the, the activity we want to do, really making sure that everyone is bought in on those plans. Um, you know, we always used to, uh, I've talked about before on, on a lot of the campaigns that I've been on, that the goal isn't owned just by the person kind of running the program. Um, it's owned by everybody involved, from your volunteer all the way up to the campaign director. Um, and so really making sure that everybody has a clear understanding of what their role is in something and what grassroots means to every one of us, right? Um, and I think that's a, a big piece of um, kind of pulling people in and making sure that everybody's empowered on the equal uh, equal footing um, and then I think that that helps kind of set the the standard and the norms for the conversation you'll be having and making sure that uh, people understand what that means depending on how you uh, how you want to determine it. Great. Um, Laura has asked a question can some uh, can we describe some of the measurement tools that we use? Um, that's a great question. <clears throat> it can vary in a lot of ways. So I think what's important for us is when we are talking about measuring our success in a campaign, um, that there are a few different pieces that we really think through, right? What, is, what are the goals that we are trying to measure towards? Um, and if it is understanding a shift in um, uh, kind of people's perception on an issue, then we might be using more and more um, things like polling and, and trying to get a general sense of the pulse. Um, if we are, are measuring the impact that we're having, um, then we're going to talk about uh, the kind of conversations we're having, how many, how many people that we've spoken with, how many people's minds have we changed, and a lot of that comes down to kind of specific questions around um, data and uh, CRMs, right, different databases that we use, content, uh, uh, sorry, customer relationships management tools, um, and so there's a lot of great things that you can do out there to really think about your progress to goal, right, determining what are your metrics along the way, um, and storing that information and then tracking it as, as we move forward. Um, Kelly has asked a great question here. How do you get people to commit to a role? Kelly, that is a wonderful question. 
Um, and I think that there's definitely other participants feel free to, to kind of chime in here and, and how that's worked. Um, one of the things that we know is, is important is really having intentional conversations with people um, around their roles and how they can be supportive in, in your effort. Um, you know, we always start with ensuring that uh, people are going to be aware of the responsibilities within a role and that they're able to rise to that occasion. Um, I'm sure you all have, have worked with individuals who are like, oh, yep, I'm happy to take that on, uh, but that might not be within their strength, a certain role. Uh, so we always like to think about kind of testing people. Um, that seems a little bit like of a tricky word, but the, the whole idea is just making sure that giving people kind of a few opportunities to really show that they're, they're able to take that role on and then having a really intentional conversation um, about what their involvement in a campaign can be. So if you're an organizer and you need someone to um, kind of be your lead on maybe working in a certain community, working with them, training them, and developing them, um, giving them some opportunities to show that they can really kind of lead there, um, and then having an intentional conversation about asking them to take that on and, and kind of own the roles that go into it, um, and kind of building them up to that. Uh, I think we'll be talking a little bit about a ladder of engagement at other points, but um, it's kind of knowing that, that people work into a certain role. They're, they're maybe not ready for it right at the start, um, but that you can kind of train and develop and, and get them up there and, and make sure you're having intentional conversations with them all the way along. Uh, great. Thank you, Lila, for, for adding in. So Lila has called out small roles with success also helps keep others engaged, right? We all know that um, what we always like to call quick wins and victories, people want to, to feel like they're a part of something. Um, and so giving them even smaller tasks to own um, can kind of really pull them into the process, keep them engaged, and you can kind of work important, uh, kind of work them up steps from, from there. Great. Oh, thank you, Laura. Also calling out that clear job descriptions also help with engagement and ownership and roles that tap into their interests and stories. So a lot of great, really helpful tips here. We always want to make sure that people know what's expected of them. That's a great call out um, and that there are ways to get involved there. Um, we had an earlier question um, from Pia or Paya. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, so you say you, we've used the civil rights movement in the United States as an example of successful campaign, but it seems after all these years there are still huge issues around civil rights in the United States. How could that campaign have been more successful? Um, so that is a really great question. What we know is when you look at a movement overall, right, um, there are going to be big pieces of your mission. Um, your mission is kind of this uh, larger path um, that you want to see succeed, right? Kind of the, the vision for, for what the U.S. is going to look like, right? When you've been successful for us. Um, but there are going to be goals within that. So what we talked about there, calling out some specific goals, right? So we might talk about ending Jim Crow, Crow laws during the civil rights movement or um, desegregating schools. And so, kind of, you know, when you're working towards a larger mission, you're going to have to create kind of campaigns and goals within the process. Um, and I think that's something that's really important for a lot of our organizations now. Um, I've worked in, in a lot of issue advocacy, and, and um, sometimes we have really lofty things that we want to do, but we know we can't do it all at once, and that it is going to be a 20, 30, 50-year process, right? And so it's an ongoing fight, and making sure that we have kind of benchmarks um, and thinking about how we track our progress along the way. Um, and then a lot of times, you know, we all know as progressives, our work isn't done, right? Uh, we have to, to keep going on it. Jeff, I think that's a really good call out you bring out. It's dependent upon how you define your goals and success, right? Um, I think that that is ex exactly what we mean. And we'll get into talking about, um, you know, really specific goals and, and thinking about how that, that works. Um, but the work is, is never done as a progressive, uh, especially here in the U.S., I'll say that. Um, I think the one final question we have here is uh, from, from Tina, and we have, how important is face-to-face -face meeting versus online communication? What a great question, especially in 2016. Um, so I think what we have found is that face-to-face -face can be really, really impactful, right? It allows you to build those uh, deep relationships and, and really get to know somebody. Um, but that doesn't mean that online communication is not effective, right? And so that's the, the world that we all live in now. I think it's really even hard to separate out in a relationship what's online versus offline. 
uh, that there are going to be touches on, on all points. Um, I think when possible, we always strive to have in-person communication, especially if you're getting someone to, to commit to a role or, or whatever that is, or um, really kind of getting to observe some of their tasks. But we know a lot can be done online as well. We talk about our ladder of engagement, and there are all of these different steps that you can kind of take with somebody online to really see how committed and how involved um, and the strengths that they have to be able to share. Um, and so there's a lot of great examples out there um, that talk about online organizing and also just give the people tools and the, the resources that you have. It's a big part of uh, 270. We love to use the word scale. And I'm sure I saw in, in your introductions, there's a lot of you kind of doing national work across Canada. And that online side really helps us scale. You can reach more people um, and kind of manage a little bit more relationships. Um, so it, it is a great um, opportunity, I think, to, to plug in with people. Uh, but we always love that that face-to-face -face and, and knowing can kind of form the deeper relationships. So, um, oh, and Lila, I like that you call out the generational difference. I'm, I'm working with a person right now who is a definitely a younger millennial than myself, and I think you're right, right? It's it's can be easier for, for some people to approach that kind of online. We always use the phrase, um, meet them where they are, right? And so knowing kind of where a person wants to engage you, and then you can kind of elevate and escalate from there. Um, but if they're ready to meet you at the coffee shop for a one-on-one, -on -one, take that opportunity. But if it takes them a little time and, and we need to kind of do some of those online warm-up conversations, um, I think that is a, a very normal thing as well uh, when we are, are first starting to engage new people in the process. You guys have some great questions here and really good feedback. I say, Keep the, um, keep the discussion going in chat. Really excited to hear that. Any other questions that I didn't get to address? Great. All right, well, keep awesome. the conversation going, and I'll pass back to Natalie. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you all for, for your participation. Those are really great questions. I'm really excited to see uh, the comments and the knowledge that's being shared. Um, so let's get into uh, planning your grassroots campaign. Um, so there are five steps to grassroots campaign planning. The first step is mission. Um, you're always going to start with understanding what your mission is. What is the overarching thing that you're trying to accomplish? What is the change that you want to see in the world? That's your mission. The second step to your campaign plan is your goal. You always want to know your goal, and your goal really is how are you going to measure success or failure? Um, how are you going to show whether or not you've achieved your mission? And then from there, in your campaign plan, once you've uh, done step one and step two of uh, coming up with your mission and goal, you want to then know your targets. Know who are the people that you're trying to reach, who are the people that you're trying to engage, who are the people in power that you need to influence to make the change that you want to see. Those are your targets. And then from there, you want to have your strategy. And uh, your strategy is really how you're going to employ the resources that you have to meet your goal. And then lastly, your targets. Um, your target, sorry, not your targets, excuse me, I meant to say tactics. Your mission, goal, target, strategy, and then tactics. Your tactics are uh, the how you're going to get that done. What are the small steps that you're going to take um, to accomplish your strategy? Um, so those are the five campaign steps, and we'll get a little bit more into this in the next slide. So we call this the strategic framework, right? And this is really how you build an effective grassroots campaign. And we talked about your mission. So when you're coming up with your strategic framework to how you're going to build out your campaign plan, you want to ask yourself these questions. So with your mission, you want to ask, what's the change that you want to see in the world? What is the end result you're working towards? What is it that you ultimately want to accomplish? From there, you want to determine your goal, and you can ask yourself these questions. What needs to happen to achieve your mission? How will you know that you met your mission, right? How will you measure success or failure? Um, by answering these questions, your goal should help you to accomplish your mission. And then you have your strategy, right? And then your strategy, you can ask yourself, how will you pull and build resources, um, build your resources to achieve your goal? So what are all the things that you'll need to achieve your goal? And then tactics, what are the specific actions you will take and when? And your tactics build on your strategy. So we can uh, provide an example to really see how this works. 
So we'll use uh, the case study from uh, the 2012 Obama campaign and how we applied the strategic framework uh, to that campaign. So the goal, the mission for the Obama for America 2012 campaign was to reelect President Obama. That was the ultimate thing that we wanted to see done, right? And then our mission, so our goal, uh, was to win 270 electoral votes. Um, in the U.S., by winning 270 electoral votes, we know that we've won the election. Um, so we knew that if we met our goal of winning 270 electoral votes, we would meet success in our mission of reelecting President Obama. From there, uh, we determined our strategy. And our strategy was to register, persuade, and turn out voters. Um, by building grassroots teams and using those teams to help execute, right? So that was our strategy. We were going to register voters, persuade, and turn them out because we knew those voters would help us get to the 270 electoral votes. And then from there, we built out our tactics, right? And our tactics were to execute strategy via grassroots uh, and constituency outreach. So grassroots outreach, we uh, did phone banking, we went canvassing, we registered voters, right? And then digital, we met people online. We also used communications, and we also employ finance to help raise money uh, for the presidential election. So that's kind of how uh, the strategic framework works using the Obama campaign example. From there, we can go into another example um, that might be more applicable. <coughs> Excuse me. And this example comes from a major labor union, right? And their mission was to support workers and families through progressive policies. And then uh, their goal, they wanted to build a, a committed volunteer base to help move their issue agenda in 2017 and beyond. Um, so they knew if they built a committed voter base, a large voter base, really to help them move their issues, then they would be supporting workers and families through progressive policies. So their strategy to do this, they wanted to create a volunteer-led organization in key communities to turn out neighbors and increase membership in the 2016 election because they knew that would impact uh, the issue agenda for 2017. So they created a volunteer-led organization. That was their strategy. And their tactics, very similar to the Obama campaign, they used grassroots tactics. They did canvassing. They uh, did phone banking. And they did one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, so that's uh, the way that this, uh, this group, this major labor union, apply the strategic framework. So now we're going to actually get into planning and uh, helping you all to develop your campaign planning. Um, so what we're going to do, earlier I referenced um, the worksheet that we'll be using. Um, if you go to your materials um, section of your menu, your control panel, you'll see a worksheet that says Organizing to Win. Um, one worksheet. You'll open that and what you'll do for this, sorry, you're going to complete steps one and two of the Organizing to Win webinar worksheet. So we're going to take 15 minutes to do that. Then um, while you're doing that, feel free to do what you've been doing through this uh, webinar, but ask your questions um, in the chat box. And then we'll have a Q&A after and talk about some of the things that you came up with. We'll do just a very quick review before we actually get into this. Step one, you're going to talk about your mission. So again, your mission is what change do you want to see in the world? What is the end result that your campaign is working towards, right? And then you have your goal. Your goal is how you know that you're going to meet success or failure when it comes to your mission. You want to ask yourself, what do you need to do by when to achieve your mission? And then another way to think about your goals is that your goal should be SMART. Um, SMART is an acronym for specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-bound. So your goal should be, starting with specific, very clear as to what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. Measurable is something that you can measure to see whether or not you've um, met your goal or going towards your goal um, and check your progress to a goal. So uh, for the Obama example that we used from the 2012 campaign, uh, we wanted to win 270 electoral votes. We can measure whether or not we got to 270 vote, uh, votes, excuse me, electoral votes. Then it has to be action-oriented. It has to drive uh, people towards action. It has to be realistic. 
something that you can actually do, something that you actually can accomplish and have the resources to accomplish. And then time bound, you want to know when you're uh, going to accomplish this goal, how long it's going to take. Those are some of the things that you want to think about when you're developing your goal. Sorry, my slide seems to be stuck. Um, give me one second. So from there, I, I can actually just leave it on this slide for now. Um, but what we're going to do is go ahead and start that worksheet, starting with your mission and then doing your goal. That's going to be steps one and two. And um, we will give you 15 minutes to accomplish this. And if you have questions while you're doing it, feel free to put it in the chat box. All right, you can get started. Thanks.
people all just checking and you have five minutes left to complete steps one and two. At this point, everyone should be wrapping up their uh, campaign plans. Um, should almost be done with steps one and two. And at this point, we'll, we can have question and answers before, but before we jump into q and I'd love if there's anyone brave who wants to actually write in their mission and goals and share that with the team and we can talk about, talk about it a little bit. Uh, between Krypton and I, we can give feedback.
grade, I see we have a mission from Lori. Her mission is to reinvigorate the Atlantic region activists to become engaged once again. Awesome, and I know it, it probably takes a little while to type. So, Lori, we'd love to see uh, your goal whenever um, that's ready. Oh, okay, you have a lot of goals. Um, so let me go ahead and read that. The first one is to set up town hall, meet and greets in first year of mandate, invite council directors to join me, endeavor to meet each local in my three-year term. So I'll stop here. Lori, these are all really great. Only difference, I'd point out that some of these goals are, are actually tactics, right? And oftentimes, tactics are, are the easiest things to do and to come up with. It's like, what are the, the direct things, the exact things we're going to do to push this forward? Um, so typically, your, your goals won't be um, so specific. They'll be, um, it will be broader, right? So you want a broader goal that will, if you do this, you know that you're going to re-engage the Atlantic region activists to become engaged once again. And maybe to do that, um, it might be helpful to, to make that your goal, right? Think of what your, your overarching thing is. Like, why do you want to reinvigorate the Atlantic region activists to become engaged? What is the one thing that you want to do? What would getting them engaged do? That would be your mission. And then... Uh, that could be then your goal to reinvigorate the Atlantic region. And then you want to think about your resources, right? And, and you've started to do that where you've written your goals and um, break that down into your strategy. And then the very specific things, things, some of those things that you have outlined and bulleted down, those will actually be um, your tactics. Kristen, is there anything that you'd add to that? Yeah, I think, um, Laura, I see that you said you had kind of your tactics as a, as a sub for each goal. So um, I think it's like the lines versus the O's, uh, which makes uh, more sense. But I think, um, you know, for, for everybody, when you're thinking about your kind of mission, which one, Lori and um, and Pia, you should definitely get together because you guys can take on re-engaging people all, all across Canada. Uh, <laughs> um, but so when you're thinking about that kind of mission, that the bigger kind of vision of, um, reinvigorating um, activists uh, to become engaged in the process again. When, you, when you're when you thinking about your SMART goals, you want to say, okay, so um, is there a certain percentage of people I want to see having uh, taken action by a certain time? Really, and try to, try to drive in some of those specifics so that way when you reach that point, um, you can know that, that that's been achieved, right? So setting up a town hall would be one way that you would be able to, in, to engage those people and kind of help you get to your overall goal. Um, but thinking about some of those, um, those specifics, right? So um, I've worked with an alumni association before, for example, and, and their mission was to have a stronger engaged alumni association. Um, and for them, that meant they wanted to double the number of paying alumni members uh, within five years. Uh, so it was a pretty, like, uh, clear-cut goal of how they were going to do that. Um, and then they did things like town halls for alumni and, and had having kind of different engagement activities along the way. Um, so just doing something where you can measure the progress towards that um, and then make sure that you have those. I liked your, your kind of sub-tactics under there. That's a great way to think about it. Excellent. Lori, thank you so much for, for sharing that. That was really great. Um, Kristen, do you want to find one? Final goal, we, we can do sure. one other. Yeah. Uh, there was, let's see, we had one up here. Scrolling through, you guys are having a great one. So, uh, Danelle, you had mission to stop um, and reverse privatization of healthcare services in Sketch One. Um, do you want to share with us your the, the kind of goals and, and tactics underneath that? Because I think that's a, that's a good one, right? Stop and reverse. Uh, so making sure that more people have um, public health care services throughout Saskatchewan is kind of that big, big mission. And Danelle, do you have um, specifics underneath that for your goal? What would your SMART goal be? Sorry, also we don't get those little dots, you know, like those helpful dots on an iPhone that tell you you're typing, so I'm assuming you're typing. <laughs>
Uh, so as you're typing and kind of sharing that, I think we can also kind of brainstorm through through this what that means, right? Um, uh, so if there are certain um, numbers that I think are, are applicable, right? So we want to stop privatization of healthcare services um, and kind of reverse that. So being able to set some some metrics around that right now. Um, if we know that there's a certain, oh, there we go. Get at least 100,000 people to sign petitions, um, 160 to accompany uh, you in, in sitting in, in 2017. Um, so that is a, a great kind of tactic to, to be able to kind of move that, right? So when you're thinking about that overall mission of making sure everyone has um, public health care services. Um, underneath that, you want to think about, okay, well, what are the metrics that we want to have kind of from there on out? Um, is there a certain percentage of the population that we want to see uh, that has access to public, you know, versus private? Um, and see if we can kind of start to reverse those numbers. So maybe right now it's 80% um, have public, but there's still that 20% that's privatization. How do we get it up to 100% within 100 years, or within 100 years? No, <laughs> within like four years or something. Um, and so then you're thinking about um, how you have 100,000 people to sign petitions and 160 people to accompany you to a sit-in. So those are uh, to a fall sitting in, in 2017. And those are some great tactics. It seems like what you're talking about is kind of as a strategy, mobilization, and, um, and engagement. So thinking about um, doing what it's going to take to to move government on your decisions, um, right? I'm assuming the 100,000 people to sign petitions are kind of getting moved that way. So making sure that you have clear distinction at, at each level of kind of where your strategies are and your tactics. But um, we've got a lot of of uh, great options there. Oh, and it looks like Lila is offering up to help maybe come. Um, she's in Manitoba and she's close to Danelle, so that we're, we're good there and she can come on over. Um, but yeah, so you've got some great measurables. I think what's also important as you're thinking about your campaign mission and goal is to know that there are going to be um, kind of goals within your goal, right? So if you have this overarching goal of making sure that more people have um, public health care services, and then you have a strategy to um, maybe target specific members of, um, of government uh, and make sure that you are going to be able to um, let them know the impact or the kind of voices there. And then underneath that strategy, you'll have goals about how many people you want to turn out. So a good call out there about having 100,000 people. Awesome, excellent. Thank you all so much for sharing your missions and your goals. Um, I'll go on to the next slide. You just did your mission, you did your goals, and of course there are three more steps to complete. There's a target strategy and tactics. Um, fortunately, we don't have enough time in this webinar to develop those next three steps. But this uh, webinar, these slides from this, the webinar will be um, going around to you all as well as the recording. Um, so you can always refer back to the previous slides um, and, the, and the information in them um, to develop your target, your strategy, and your tactics. Uh, before we conclude, we wanted to see if you all have any other questions about mission goal, target strategy, about grassroots organizing, any of that. And if no questions, we'd love to hear if you all have any key takeaways, anything that you've learned from this webinar that you want to apply um, to your campaign work and your grassroots organizing. And I see we have a comment from Lila. She says, I found that it gave me a bit more direction and a clear template to organize. Awesome. That's so glad to hear. Good to hear. That was our hope um, with these materials that they can uh, provide that. And the worksheets will be very helpful 
for planning. Yes, definitely, and, and I hope that you all will take the time, carve out the time um, in the day to really just go through and finish the, the other five, the other three steps, rather, to the five steps. Um, I think it will be really helpful just to get a holistic picture of a campaign plan and what you can do to start um, working towards that. Excellent. Well, thank you all again for your participation today. Um, you all have made this such a great conversation. And I know Kristen and I also learned so much from you all, from your comments and the things that you shared. Um, I hope that you all have a good head start to, to doing your campaign planning and having a better understanding of grassroots organizing and can really apply these tactics. Sorry that our slide says uh, NCONE at 270 Strategies and Jesse Botang. Jesse did our last uh, training with us, but uh, Kristen, who's on this call, you can reach her at kpurdy at 270strategies.com, and we really love your feedback. So if you could, please complete um, our quick survey. It's a bit.ly link at the bottom of your screen, so please uh, go ahead and tell us how you felt, if there are things that we can do to make these webinars better in the future, we'd love to hear that. Um, and again, I mentioned this is the first of three webinars. Well, this is the second time we're doing this webinar, but we have two others that are coming up, one in November, one in December. So we're really excited, and we hope that you all will continue to join us uh, for that. If you have any further questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. You can also reach out to Alejandra um, from Broadbent. And again, it was a pleasure to speak with you all and do this webinar. And